Hello, hello. Welcome everybody to the three days, three ways, the Enneagram boosts your leadership skills. So if you're here and you're joining me, make sure to say hello. Um, I also want you to tell me, do you, do you know your number? Do you have a hunch you think you know your number? Do you like kind of think you know your number, but you just like, gosh, just something feels off. Um, or maybe you don't know your number and that's why you're here. Like, it doesn't matter. Um, hey, Teresa, um, because I can tell you that I thought I was a, a certain number for a really long time, only to find out I actually wasn't that number. So while everybody's joining, tell me your number, what you think you, your number is, or whether you know your number or not, that's fine. Just say, hey, I don't know my number because... That's why we're here. So, hello, D. Yeah, you're. Uh, you think you're a one, Tracy? You're a two. Awesome. Okay, and I'll try to keep up on the chat. So, a little bit more about me, um, in case you don't. D, D. Yes, you want to be a one, and we're going to talk about all the amazing things that come with being a one. And I'm not just biased because I'm married to a one who is just the most wonderful, wonderful person. So uh, more about me. I am married to a one. Um, I'm Kelly Thompson. I'm a leadership coach. I know a lot of you are new in here. Um, I help women make impact in the rooms where decisions are made. And so a lot of times I'm helping them um, boost their confidence to lead at the next level or make a brave career change. I personally spent over 15 years um, in corporate America and then took a very brave leap to start my own leadership coaching practice. Um, guys, for years, I was a Myers-Briggs fanatic. I taught Myers-Briggs in corporate. And one of the core differences about Myers-Briggs and the Enneagram is the Myers-Briggs tells you, and, and even the DISC or the Strengths Finder, you know, what you're good at, how you get your um, energy, um, you know, um, how you make decisions, how you connect with people. But the Enneagram tells you why you do those things. The Enneagram is kind of like an ego reading, okay? So even though the Enneagram feels new, it's actually very ancient. Like you can, you can track the Enneagram back to like, you know, early like, you know, 1000s, okay? Um, it's just that now it's starting to gain steam, it's starting to gain popularity because people find that more than any other personality assessment, which I have not met one I didn't like, it tells you why you do the things you do. And guys, when we know the why behind what we do and how we show up, we have the power to make incredible transformations. And that's why the Enneagram has been so powerful for me is because it was like, oh, that's why I do that. That's why I have that habit. That's why that behavior kept coming up for me. That's why I had that thought track in my head. And when we know the why, we're actually talk a lot about that tomorrow in, in the mindset stuff. It tells us how we move beyond it. So let's see who's with us. Um, Ashley, you said, what's your guess for me? Um, here's a fun thing about the Enneagram. So with the Myers-Briggs, sometimes it's easier to type people because it types you based on behavior. Like, are you an introvert or an extrovert, Ashley? You know, um, are you more intuitive or do you like things step by step? You know, do you prefer to make decisions with logic, data, or do you like to, you know, make them via your values or harmony? It's easier to see that about people because it's very behavior based. But the thing about the Enneagram is it is based on motivation. So it's all about what motivates you. And that's why it's really hard. And we shouldn't type people because then we're getting to the whole judgy thing and all that. But you shouldn't type people because lots of times, Ashley, I can see how you show up in the world. Um, I can see your behaviors. But see, I don't often know what motivates you to show up and do those things. So for instance, like two people. So Regina, um, you don't know your type yet. Perfect. This is why you're here. Um, Dee, Brittany, Teresa, everyone who's here, um, say hello. Drop me your type if you think you know it. You and I might both um, procrastinate, let's just say. We all might procrastinate. But the reasons 
why we procrastinate are different because we have different motivations. D might procrastinate because she's a one and she's stalling because she wants to look perfect. I might procrastinate because I'm a five and I think I don't know enough yet. Hey, Karen. So Karen's an eight. Um, Karen might procrastinate because she's looking to be maybe more in control of something or she's trying to avoid, avoid a vulnerability. So um, Danielle might procrastinate because she doesn't want to appear to be a failure as a three. So there's there's different reasons, okay? So cluing into this is really honing into um, way number one, which is when you boost your insight as a leader, you can boost your leadership skills. So I often say in my coaching, and one of the reasons why I brought the Enneagram into my coaching practice is I believe that there are um, four key things that we as, as leaders and as women need to show up fully as full leaders at work, and that is insight. We have to have insight on who we are, what we want, and why we do the things that we do. And so today is all about finding your number and really digging into some self-insight. Because the more you know yourself, and the more you have knowledge around the things that you do, you can have huge ahas as leaders to say, oh, that's why I treat this group like that. Oh, that's why every time this report comes due, I act like that. Oh, that's why every time I have to make a big presentation, I do the things that I do. This is why my people get frustrated with me when I do X behavior. So it gives you insight because when you have insight, you can go, okay, now I understand. Now I understand why people view me the way that they do. Now I understand what I need what my desires are. And when you know what your insights are, you can start to make conscious choices. So in sum, I love the Enneagram and I love using it in my coaching practice because it helps us read our ego and it helps us move into our highest self. So I love this chat. If you guys have questions, come in, let me know. Good morning, Sue, thank you for joining us. I want to talk to you a little bit about how to type yourself without a test and whether you know your type um, or whether you don't know your type. This is just like a super fun little game exercise. And you know what? You can replay this um, to your spouse or your partner or whomever you live with or, you know, your BFF and um, have a little bit of fun with this. OK, so on um, I believe it's page two of your workbook. There is a way to find your number. OK, and I'm just going to walk through a series of four scenarios. So what you see in your workbook is four different categories, worldview, desires, stance, center of intelligence. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read some statements. And as I read these statements, I want you to circle the numbers that resonate with you. OK. And when we get to the bottom, you're probably going to have some numbers that keep coming up for you and that will point you to your type. And then I'll kind of give you the so what factor at the end. So go ahead, open your workbooks. As you guys have questions, ask them. And at the end, we'll kind of land the plane and give you some so what about all of this. So step one, there are nine different worldviews. So as a leader, I don't know about you guys. But when I heard the worldviews like this, I was like, oh my God, you mean not everybody, like people see the world differently than me? And when I started to recognize that I had my own worldview and that was the lens on which I was viewing everything and that other people looked at things differently, where I had conflicts, it was like massive ahas. So as I even kind of go through all of these, you might start even having some of these ahas. Okay, so let's go through them. So circle the numbers. It can be more than one. Sometimes you're going to resonate with two, three, or four of them, and that's fine. So if this resonates with you, circle that number. Okay, so type one worldview. The world is imperfect, and I can work towards improving it and improve and improving myself. I must make the world a better place. Type two worldview. I believe that people depend on me for help. I have worth because I worth because I am liked and needed. I deserve to be loved because I am loving. Type three worldview. I believe that the world values winners and I must avoid failure at all costs. 
I will organize my world to ensure my success. Type four worldview. Compared with others, I sense that something is different in my life and I need to strive for my true identity. Type five worldview. I see the world as a place that invades my privacy and I believe that I need to protect my resources and energy. I seek knowledge and understanding. Type six worldview. I see the world as a threatening or unsafe place and I must, um, I am driven to test and question things and people to feel safer. Type seven worldview. The world is full of exciting possibilities, ideas and experiences, and I need to explore them as much as possible. Type eight worldview. The world is a tough and unjust place in which only the strong survive. Good things happen to those who take control. And then there's type nine worldview. The world is not a harmonious place where I can fully assert myself. I need uh, people need to treat each other with respect. So hopefully you, a couple of those resonated with you and you've circled the numbers that resonate and feel free. This will stay up if you need to watch the replay and listen to it again, I'm leaving the replay up, okay? If you have questions, pop them in the chat. All right, let's go to the next one. So each type not just has a way that they view the world, but they have some core desires. This core desire, you guys, oftentimes is very unconscious to us. And until we actually get it heard out loud, we're like, oh my gosh, yes. Like at a subconscious level, this is what I've been driving for. This explains why I lead my team the way I do, why I treat this person the way I do, why I seek the projects the way that I do. Okay, so I'm gonna reach through, read through each of the desires and circle the ones that resonate with you. Type one. Their desire is to be good, to have integrity, to be right or perfect and avoid mistakes. Type two desire is to feel loved, needed and appreciated. The type three core desire is to feel valuable and worthwhile, succeed and be the best at what you do. The type four core desire is to find themselves and their significance to create an identity, to express their individual individuality. <laughs> that was the hard word for a Tuesday. <laughs> Type five, to be capable and competent, independent, and not rely on others for resources. Type six core desire, to have security and support and reassurance. Type seven core desire is to be satisfied and content to have their needs fulfilled, to avoid pain and experience all the possibilities. Type eight core desire is to protect themselves, to be in control of their own life and destiny and stay in control. Type nine core desire is to have inner stability, peace of mind, to create harmony and avoid conflict. So I think you can see from some of these core desires, you probably work with some different folks and maybe some things is coming up for you that's like, oh, so maybe that's why they do what they do. All right, I'm gonna talk about something that's really cool about the Enneagram. So it's not just about our worldview and our core desires, but it basically says that uh, we have three stances, three social stances. This is basically like how we get what we want in everyday life and what energizes us in our social relationships. So as a leader, you're probably gonna start to notice, oh, I'm one of, there's, there's three. So there's assertive, compliant, and withdrawn. And as you notice that you're one of these things, you might notice that one of your direct reports, your boss, your colleagues is one of the other ones. And you're probably gonna go, oh, this is why maybe I'm judging this person for doing that. Or maybe this is why I'm, you know, struggling to engage or connect with my team or I'm leaving in the, in the dust or whatever that looks like. So let me read. I'm going to read each of the three stances and there's three numbers that correlate and I will tell you which ones to circle. Okay. So the assertive stance, remember, this is how you get what you want in everyday life. And this is what energizes you in social relationships. 
Assertives can be considered energetic, extroverted, and independent. They often act without consulting other people. People with an assertive social style, they move against the world in an independent, energetic way, going out of their way to get what they want and need. They find challenges energizing and like to get to the point and just get things done. Their response to resistance is often to push harder rather than to slow down and reflect. So if this sounds like you, not only can you just pop in the chat, but you can circle numbers three, seven, and eight. So if you identify with assertive, circle three, seven, and eight. The next type of style, and again, guys, there's no one right style here. These are just three different styles. The next style is compliant. These people are often dedicated, responsible, and they want to do what's expected of them. They want to do things the right way. They perform best with clear expectations and guidelines. Compliant types move towards the world going along with established social norms or rules or ways of doing things. They're dutiful. They're cooperative in their efforts to get what they want and need. They want to do what is expected of them. Okay, so they're going to look side to side and say, what's expected of me? If this sounds like you, I want you to circle numbers one, two, and six. All right, and then here's the last one. This is the withdrawn style. These folks are introspective, introverted, and oftentimes called quiet. They get what they want by connecting to their inner world. Okay, so when things happen, they're going to connect inward. They often um, move away from the world because they tend to look inward and become contemplative in their efforts to get what they want. They may need time and space to process and share their ideas and prefer to disengage and deeply consider issues before responding. These type of people go, oh, you've really given me a lot to think about. They're going to go think about it get contemplative, look inward, and then come back to you later. If this sounds like you, I want you to circle numbers four, five, and nine. All right, so step four. So this is really fascinating, and I think one of the most fascinating things about the Enneagram, and one of the things I teach a lot in my coaching, is that as women leaders, we need to learn to make decisions with all of our intelligence. In fact, we have three brains. So neuroscience has actually proven that we don't just have the brains in our head, we actually have a brain in our head. And there is a cluster of nerves that sits actually in our heart and in our gut that processes information at 11 million bits per second. Like, holy crap. And that's even more amazing when you realize that the brains in our head are verbal brains that convert this knowledge to language only process, process information at about 40 bits per second. So there truly is these three brains that's offering knowledge. And so I want to talk about each of these three brains because in the Enneagram, your type is dominant in one of these centers. Now, it doesn't mean we don't use all three. And one of the things I teach in my workshop here in a couple of weeks is how to use all three so that you can make decisions with more clarity and confidence and use all of your intelligence, okay? So just because you favor one, I want you to think about the one that you favor, like your instinct. Like, what do you do first before you use your other centers? So I'll read these. So the thinking center, people who prefer the thinking center, May you might tend to ask questions like, well, what do I know? Or what do we know? What's the best way to approach this? What if? You're a what if -er. You're objective, you're analytical, you're detail-oriented, and you're efficient at planning activities. If this is you, I want you to circle the numbers five, six, and seven. The feeling center, these people often ask, well, how do the people involved feel about this? What does this all mean? Oftentimes people in the feeling center are highly attuned to how others are responding to them, okay? How are they feeling about me? How are they feeling about me? What are they feeling about me? You are emotionally and connected and aware of others and you're often interested in others and aware of the less tangible, more human aspects of situations and decisions. If this sounds like you, I want you to circle numbers two, three, and four. And then the last one, the action and the body center. So these individuals often ask, okay, what's the priority? What needs to get done? Or how can we get started? Like they want to take all this stuff and they like put it into a plan. What do we want to do? 
These individuals are very sensitive to sensations in their body. They often have just a gut instinct. They act on their instinct. They're strongly attuned to them. And you're typically productive making things happen. A nuance about this in that type nines oftentimes have to kind of co overcome their inertia to do things. They are attuned to the energy in their body, but that, that energy in their body can just be like, eh, let's take a nap. <laughs> so if this sounds like you, I want you to circle one, eight, and nine. Okay, so we've gone through the typing exercise and I'm super curious to tell me in the chat what numbers have come up for you. Um, if you already know your number, I want you to tell me, did, did, did you, did your number like come up again? Did this typing system say, yep, there it is again. <laughs> I will tell you that for the longest time, um, I thought I was a one. Um, but as it turns out, after I've done some more of my inner work, um, you know, really paid attention to my style, my, whether I was assertive, um, compliant or withdrawn, really checked in with my, my centers of intelligence, I am absolutely a five. And knowing that has given me tremendous insight into how I approach the world, um, why I procrastinate, um, how I tend to connect with people, um, what holds me back from, you know, continuing to build my business or try new things. You know, as a leader in corporate America, like learning my number really gave me insight onto like, oh, so that's why I would hesitate to share my ideas. You know, oh, that's why oftentimes, you know, I would stall and be scared to, to share my ideas with somebody or launch this program. Oh, that's why oftentimes, you know, maybe, you know, my team viewed me as withdrawn or um, not connecting and, you know, those sorts of things. So this self insight helps you grow as a leader. And as I always say, you cannot evolve yourself. Let me start over. You cannot evolve your team to a higher level than you've evolved yourself. And knowing your roadblocks, having this insight helps you develop yourself as a leader because the higher and better you develop yourself, overcome your own ego and you know learn your own lessons, the better you're going to be able to do this for your team. So let's see what folks are saying. So one and eight, we're tied for UD. Okay, awesome. So two different action centers there. So what I want you guys to do, so Teresa, you're a two, but I noticed a lot of one come up. So um, we are not gonna talk about this this time, but you could be have a strong one wing because one and three are on either side of two in the Enneagram. So it could be that you're leaning into your one and your work might require that, Teresa. So you may see that come up because work demands that of you. D, the same thing for you. Could be that work demands something from you um, that makes you kind of act into another type. So here's what I want you guys to do. This is your day one homework. And I hope you guys participate because there's going to be a prize that I announce on day four for participation. Today is all about insight. So I want you to notice what were the top, maybe you have one number you've circled consistently. Or maybe you have two numbers you've, you've circled consistently. Like if you go through here and you're like, yep, I've circled five and six consistently, or I've circled four and nine consistently. I gave you two resources in your workbook. I want you to go read those numbers that have come up most frequently for you. And as you read the descriptions of those numbers, I want you to um, pick the one that resonates with you the most. And you'll know that it resonates with you because you'll definitely identify with the core fear and you'll definitely um, resonate with the motivation. Because again, Enneagram is about motivation, not behavior. It helps you understand the why behind what you do. So really notice the desires, the fears, and the motivations. Look at the description as well, of course, and see what resonates with you. And then for your homework, I, I'll actually put up a separate post that says day one homework as soon as we're done here. And I want you to just kind of, after you read all this, I want you to ask yourself some questions. Well, the first one, of course, is what number resonates most with you? Um, what initial ahas does this give you? both like in your own personal development journey, but even as a leader, like, oh, maybe this is why I'm viewed the way I am. Or maybe this is why I struggle to get what I want or articulate my ideas or communicate my plans, whatever that looks like for you. What well, ahas. As a leader, 
what strengths can you lead with? So you're going to learn about some of the strengths of your number. Okay. So how can you lead with that? How can you build on those? And then I, let's look at some blind spots. This is what makes the Enneagram so powerful is there might be some things. And I'll tell you, you guys, when I first learned I was a five, I like couldn't even talk about it for a week. Like I felt like I had like this shame bath, like come over me. I'm like, who knows about this? Like who knows about my need for privacy or the way that I hoard energy and resources? Like who knows that like I have to hide and research a bunch of stuff and feel super confident before I even talk? Like who knows about this? And that's okay. Some of this can be really kind of like, oh my goodness, because it's kind of outing your ego a little bit. But the cool thing about it is it's like, you know what? It's kind of those things where it's like, well, everybody kind of knew this about me. And now I'm kind of discovering for myself. And when I discover this for myself now, I can actually do something about it. In those moments when I live my life, I can start asking myself some questions like my blind spot of um, competency feeling like I need to be 100% competent before I do something. That's a blind spot for me. Well, how has that hindered my leadership? Well, it's definitely held me back from raising my hand because I didn't feel 100% competent or my communication or my ability to get into action. A huge blind spot for me as a five was um, continuing to read and read and learn and learn and learn. And at some point, Kelly, you had to stop reading and reading and learning and learning and just get into action. So learning that about myself, like, was like, I can now ask myself, okay, I'm going to learn until this stopping point, And then I got to do something about it. And so that's why the Enneagram is so powerful. So I'll make a homework post. I'll recap this all in an email, but just let me know what number resonates with you. What ahas did you get? What strengths can you lead with? And maybe like what blind spots or something where you're like, wow, knowing this about myself is going to help me really lead at the next level because I can bust through that roadblock. I can overcome that blind spot. So you don't need to answer all three questions in the homework, at least just answer one of them. But I just want you to start really digging into some of this insight and how it can help you. So guys, what questions do you have? Was this typing, did it, did it make sense? Did it feel pretty easy? Tomorrow, while you guys are thinking and typing in your questions, um, tomorrow we're going to talk about mindset. So I'm talking about three things, insight, mindset, and action. So tomorrow we're actually going to kind of dig into some of those core fears and talk about how you can change your mindset and not let that core fear hold you back as a leader at work. And then day three, we're going to talk about how to get into action. So we're really going to talk about all the centers of intelligence and how you can use your center of intelligence, but then actually tap into the other two centers of intelligence so that you can be well, one, use all three brains, but then be more emotionally intelligent as a leader. How do you connect with people and build into your empathy and your heart center? How do you get into action? And how do you use all your data, logic, facts to make really good decisions? So thank you for joining me, you guys. I hope this was super helpful. If you're watching on replay, definitely ask me questions. I'll be checking the chat. I'll be doing all the things. And then um, post your homework. And every time you post, you'll be enter to win a fabulous prize. And if you've been part of my live series before, then um, you know they're good. Um, I hope I'm, I want to say your name correctly. Is it uh, Von Visa? Thank you. I'm glad that you found this was really helpful. I've seen this a couple other places and I agree. I think this is just a great quick way to at least narrow down like two or three types that you can research. And the cool thing about the Enneagram is you can type yourself just by reading it and you don't even have to take a test. So thank you for that. And thank you for being here. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I will see you guys tomorrow. I cannot wait to read about your ahas and all the things and feel free to share whatever you want to share. And if you want to share it with me privately, I always love to hear that as well. So hope you guys have an amazing Tuesday and I will see you tomorrow.